General. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen from Wisconsin, for what purposes does the gentleman seek recognition? We'll strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we ought to step back from the political rhetoric and ask exactly what this contempt citation deals with. And I'm going to try to use my time to do that. First and foremost, and most concerning to every American, or at least it should be, is the fact that they want an unredacted uh, report that it includes information on grand jury testimony. The committee, by making this insistence and in issuing this subpoena, is telling the Attorney General of the United States to commit a crime because it's a crime for anybody to disclose grand jury material to anybody else. That includes the Attorney General, it includes the prosecutors in the Justice Department, it includes the witnesses who have been subpoenaed and have testified before the grand jury. It means everybody. And if the grand jury system is to work, and remember, witnesses can't even bring their attorneys into a grand jury, then the secrecy is going to have to be maintained. Now, all of us know that it's really impossible for the people who work on this Capitol Hill to keep a secret. Uh, if there is an unredacted version, completely unredacted version, including the grand jury testimony, which is unredacted, it'll be on the front page of every newspaper in the country within 48 hours and talked about incessantly on the cable news shows, whether you watch Fox News or whether you watch MSNBC. Now, I think it is absolutely shocking that the majority of this committee is going to ask the chief law enforcement officer of the United States to commit a crime. Shocking. And there are no exceptions to what is to be dis disclosed in this unredacted version. That includes the grand jury testimony. And by citing the Attorney General of the United States for contempt of Congress, for saying, I'm standing up for the law, I am not going to break the law by complying with that part of your subpoena, shows an overreach on the part of the majority. If we are to be a government of laws and not of men or of people, uh, then we have to obey the law on this end of Pennsylvania Avenue as well as on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue. And we are not doing that. Now, what else has been redacted? There has been redactions relative to ongoing investigations. Now, do we want to let the people that the Justice Department is investigating know all about uh, the ongoing investigations? I don't think the public interest is served by that. Whether somebody is guilty or not should be determined by the jury in a trial. That's what the American system is, and that's what a lot of the Bill of Rights protects. You also uh, have a protection against people who are peripherally involved in that. Uh, and that it, they were just on the edges of this. They were interviewed, and nothing came of the interview because they didn't have any evidence on what was being investigated. But there's a character assassination squad running around this town that even if you were on the periphery and went and voluntarily talked to the FBI or Mr. Mueller's team, you know, you're going to end up having your good name and your reputation smeared even though you didn't do anything. So this is definitely an overreach. Those reactions uh, the redactions, excuse me, uh, ended up being justified redactions. And I can understand the reluctance on the part of the Attorney General or anybody else that watches the way this institution and the people who work here operate, uh, that anything that is supposed to not get out in the public uh, realm will get out in the public realm with a leak. and. If this place weren't as leaky as a sieve, I would not be opposed to what the chairman is doing because I've stood up for oversight during my entire career uh, in this body. But it is leaky as a sieve. And I think what we're doing here is forcing the attorney general to break the law, to place in jeopardy innocent people 
you know, who were not involved in any of the things that Mr. Mueller ended up investigating and shaming ourselves in the process. My time is up. I'm really here in mourning for a once great judiciary committee. I know my first term, 05 and 06, um, I saw our current chairman as a champion for privacy rights, for civil rights, for Fourth Amendment rights, Fifth Amendment rights, and something dramatically has changed over the years. There was concern back then about too much power through the FISA courts, through the Patriot Act, and we shared a number of those concerns. And now this committee majority is on the wrong side of a very important historic time. We've never had the intelligence community, the FBI, people at the top of the DOJ, abusing their powers to create a case against a president where there was none, where assets were actually used to try to set up members of the Trump campaign when there was no case, to try to create a case. We ought to be all over that. We ought to be demanding answers from the FISA judge or judges who were either A, content to have fraud committed against their courts, or were complicit. Maybe it was Peter Strzok's buddy that he bragged about in his text that was going to be the FISA judge that uh, signed warrants where there was no probable cause of anything. This was an attempted coup, and history is bringing that into focus more and more clearly. And what does this committee do about the abuses, the attempted coup? It comes in and decides we're going to go after the attorney general who's trying to clean up the mess. Christopher Race sure hasn't. Instead of asking from the intel community, let us see the 100% certain proof you have that Hillary Clinton's personal server was hacked by China. No, he covers it up. He says, we still hadn't seen it. Well, they hadn't asked to see it. There is a disaster that has occurred in our justice system, and this committee has oversight responsibilities, and we are abusing those. This, this motion for contempt is not being done in good faith. I'm not going to call anybody on this committee the names that my colleague from Tennessee just did in violation of our rules of decorum. But the truth is, we know that this committee majority is not acting in good faith. How? Because they're moving con for contempt for an attorney general failing to turn over material that this majority, at least some, maybe it's just the staff, but some people know that you can't hold someone in contempt. You can vote to do that, but you can't be in contempt for failing to produce things that are illegal for you to produce. How do we know somebody over there knows that this is wrong? Is because there was an offer, look, Attorney General Barr, if, if you'll join us in going to court and getting a court order so that we can get the grand jury proceedings and evidence, then we will disregard the contempt. Well, that's evidence of a state of mind by the majority that at least somebody over there knows you cannot be con in contempt for failing to produce what would be illegal to produce without a court order. You're on the wrong side of history. And there is no joy here 
in seeing the abuses. I hope and pray literally for the day when we can join forces and quit trying to push this idea of an attempted coup and uncover the abuses that have truly gone on. My time's expired. The committee says two. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman. For what purpose is the gentleman? We'll strike, we'll strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Bill Barr is following the law, and what's his reward? Democrats are going to hold him in contempt. I don't, think the, I don't think today's actually about getting information. I don't think it's about getting the unredacted Mueller report. I don't think last week's hearing was actually about having staff question the Attorney General. I think it's, as my colleague said earlier, I think it's all about trying to destroy Bill Barr because Democrats are nervous he's going to get to the bottom of everything. He's going to find out how and why this investigation started in the first place. Never forget what Bill Barr said a few weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, when he testified in front of the Senate Finance Committee. He said a lot of important things, but he said three, excuse me, four very interesting things. First, he said there was a failure of leadership at the upper echelon, term he used, upper echelon of the FBI. We all know that's the case. Director Comey's been fired. Deputy Director McCabe fired, lied three times under oath, according to the Inspector General. FBI Counsel Jim Baker demoted and left, currently under investigation by the Justice Department. Lisa Page demoted and left. Peter Strzok, Deputy Head of Counterintelligence, demoted and fired. Peter Strzok, the guy who ran the Clinton investigation and the Russian investigation. There was certainly a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI. Second thing the Attorney General said three and a half weeks ago in front of the Senate Finance Committee, spying did occur said it twice. Yes, spying did occur. Third, he said, there's a basis for my concern about the spying that took place. And maybe the most interesting thing, two terms he used that frankly I find frightening. He said there was, in his judgment, he thinks there may have been unauthorized surveillance and political surveillance. Scary terms. We got to go back to January 3rd, 2017. Senator Schumer on the Rachel Maddow show talking about then President-elect Trump says this, if you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Now, I don't know if the FBI went after President Trump in six ways, but I sure know they went after him in two ways. And the first one is the now famous dossier. On October 21st, 2016, the FBI used one party's opposition research document as the basis to go to a secret court to get a warrant to spy on the other party's campaign. That happened. Democrat National Committee, the Clinton campaign, paid Perkins Coie Law Firm, who hired Fusion GPS, who then hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who did what? Talked to Russians and put together this salacious, unverified document that became the basis to get a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign. They did it. And when they went to the court, they didn't tell them important things like who paid for it. They didn't tell them that Christopher Steele had already told the FBI and the Justice Department that he was, quote, desperate to stop Trump. And they didn't tell the court that Christopher Steele had been fired by the FBI because he's out talking to the press. They did that. And second, just last Thursday, just last Thursday, New York Times story, FBI sent investigator posing as an assistant to meet with the Trump aide in 2016. FBI sent someone in, pretending to be somebody else, to talk with George Papadopoulos, who was with the Trump campaign. You know what they call that? You know what they call that? It's called spying. They did it. They did it. They did it twice, and who knows how much more. And what I know is Bill Barr has said he's going to get to the bottom of it. And think about the term he used again. This is important. Political surveillance the in the United States of America. I will not yield. Think about that term. He's going to get to the, he said he's going to put a team together, going to investigate all this. This is critical. And never forget the guy who ran this investigation, Peter Strzok, ran the Clinton investigation and then launched and ran the Trump-Russia investigation. Never forget what he said. Trump should lose $100 million to zero. We need an insurance policy told Lisa Page, don't worry, Lisa, we'll stop Trump. This is what Bill Barr wants to investigate. And as, other, as my colleagues have said, this is the House Judiciary Committee with the history this committee has in protecting fundamental liberties and protecting the Constitution. Last week, there was another important document, document Emmett Flood sent to the Attorney General. I just want to read a couple sentences. 
under our system of government, unelected executive branch officers and intelligence agency personnel are supposed to answer to the person elected by the people, the president, and not the other way around. This is not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's a matter of having a government responsible to the people, to we the people. In, a partisan, in the partisan commotion surrounding the Mueller report, it would be well to remember that what can be done to a president can be done to any of us. And this committee is supposed to look out for that fundamental fact more than anything else. And we are not doing that today. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida, see recognition. I'm going to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad, glad to see that the microphone's working this week. My good friend from Georgia just asked the operative question: How can we impeach if we don't get the documents? How can we impeach if we don't get the documents? Ladies and gentlemen, this hearing is not about the Attorney General. It's not about the Mueller report, 92% of which everyone in America has had the opportunity to read. It's not about the fact that even the portions that the American people haven't been able to read, the chairman's been able to go read had he chosen. This is all about impeaching the president. Now, why don't they just say it? Why don't they just jump to the impeachment proceedings like their liberal media overlords are telling them to do? Well, the reason is that the American people don't support impeachment. And it's easy to understand why. They actually went and elected Donald Trump, president of the United States. And I don't think people are going to support impeaching a president who's doing so well. I mean, you got 3.2% growth in the economy. The Trump economy is hot. And the reason we're doing so well is as a consequence of the president's policies. And so at a time when my Democrat colleagues are focused on the next election and not solutions to the problems facing Americans, they can't attack the president's policies because people are doing well. So typically they roll next to identity politics that based on what you look like, who you pray to, or who you love, you can't possibly support Republicans. But African Americans are doing better. Hispanics are doing better. Women are doing better. We are seeing a rising tide that is truly lifting all boats in this country. And so now we have this effort not to argue with policies, not to typically go to the identity politics that functions as the organizing principle of today's Democratic Party. They have to delegitimize the guy that the won, delegitimize the guy that people voted for, but they don't have the guts to do it directly, and so they're going after the Attorney General. Now, the gentleman from Georgia in his last remark said, we are hiding behind the rules. Hiding behind the rules. These are federal laws that dictate what the Attorney General can and cannot do. We're not hiding behind the rules. We just like to follow them. By the way, it's not following the rules that got us in this trouble in the first place. When the Inspector General testified before us, he said it's the fundamental fact that during the investigations of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you saw continuous examples of a one-off here, a violation of protocol there. The Inspector General said never before had he seen a circumstance where the very same team that was investigating Hillary Clinton would then go and investigate the other person that was involved in the 2016 presidential contest. About a month ago, in this committee, I laid out the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I think that folks watching at home can probably follow along and see where we're headed. First, my Democratic colleagues were in denial. When they saw that there was no collusion after saying for 22 months that the president was an agent of the Russian government, after saying for 22 months that there was actual evidence of collusion, they were in denial when they saw the conclusion that there wasn't. Then there was anger. It had to be the Attorney General's fault. Mueller didn't make a decision on obstruction. Somebody had to. The Attorney General did. So they got bad at him. And we had this whole kerfluffle of anger. Well, now we know the third step. Bargaining. Well, Mr. Attorney General, you've given us 92% of the Mueller report, but we have to bargain for the remaining 8% because that's really where we think the action is. Well, Mr. Attorney General, you spent five hours before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Three of our presidential candidates got to question you. You offered to come before the House Judiciary Committee. You offered to come for an additional hour of questioning. But we have to bargain so that our staff lawyers can ask you questions. Now, I don't think it's a good sign that the next sign after bargaining is depression. So I, I feel for my Democrat colleagues. But after that, we get to acceptance. And that's sure something that I'm looking forward to, because there are some really good ideas that my Democratic colleagues have once they kind of get to acceptance on the no Russia collusion thing. 
My, my friend, the gentleman from Rhode Island, has excellent ideas about how to change the way that consumers interface with big tech companies. My, my colleague from the state of New York is right, that if the First Step Act is the only step act, then, there's, then that would be a bad thing. We need to do more on criminal justice reform. My, my colleague uh, who's not with us from California, Mr. Swalwell, he's got great ideas to unlock potential cures with medical cannabis reform, but we're not doing any of those things. And by the way, I bet a bunch of my friends on the other side of the aisle low-key wish that their actual bills that would impact the lives of Americans would get heard instead of this garbage. The Obama administration ran an intel operation against the Trump campaign. Peter Strzok opened it up, the dossier kept it going, and now the Democrats need to get over it. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, move to I'll withdraw my amendment because it's not ready at this point. And I appreciate that. The gentleman from uh, Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have heard some extraordinary claims this morning. I've been taking notes as my colleagues have, have commented on all of this. Uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee said the executive branch is, quote, taking a wrecking ball to the Constitution. And, Mr. Chairman, you said that the DOJ doesn't recognize Congress as a co-equal branch of government or acknowledge our oversight responsibility. Mr. Cohen said we're trampling upon Article I. Anyone who looks at these facts objectively knows the truth is exactly the opposite. The Attorney General and the DOJ are objecting to this charade based upon the rule of law. They are trying to protect the integrity of our institutions. And Mr. Chairman, you said that the preliminary protective assertion of executive privilege this morning was a last-minute outburst. It's exactly the opposite of that. In fact, let, the, the letter that the, the DOJ sent to, to you this morning says, and I quote, regrettably, you, Mr. Chairman, have made this assertion necessary by your assistance, insistence upon scheduling a premature contempt vote. The letter goes on to say, you've terminated our ongoing negotiations and abandoned the, abandoned the accommodation process. And as we have repeatedly explained, the Attorney General could not comply with your subpoena in its current form without violating the law, court rules, and court orders, and without threatening the independence of the Department of Justice's prosecutorial functions. That's a quoting from the letter. The facts matter. The letter that the Attorney General sent to the President this morning that, that accompanies all this says, quote, the committee demands all of the special counsel's investigative files, which consist of, everybody listen, consist of millions of pages of classified and unclassified documents bearing upon more than two dozen criminal cases and investigations, many of which are ongoing. These materials include law enforcement information, information about sensitive intelligence sources and methods, and grand jury information that the department is prohibited from disclosing by law. That's the letter the attorney general sent to the president explaining all this. Look, we're attorneys on here. Most of us are attorneys on this committee. What does the law say? The courts have repeatedly affirmed the rules on all this. April 5th, just last month, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit ruled in McKeever versus Barr. The district courts may disclose grand jury materials only where they have positive authority to do so, particularly through the exceptions to grand jury secrecy listed in Rule 6E. The Court of Appeals explained the vital interests, they said, that the rule of grand jury secrecy seeks to protect, including preserving the willingness and candor of witnesses called before the grand jury, not alerting the target of investigation who might otherwise flee or interfere with the grand jury, and preserving the rights of a suspect who might later be exonerated. These are critically important principles and traditions for up to us to uphold, and it is, again, the law. The, the chairman can file suit for access to the 6E material, but instead he blasts the attorney general for not joining him in doing so. Why hasn't the chairman taken that step? I think I know why. Perhaps because he knows that his rationale for demanding the unredacted report is wholly insufficient. The, look, this bears repeating. The chairman claims he needs the full unredacted report as part of the March 4, 2019 investigation into the 81 individuals and organizations related in some way to President Trump. But let's make a couple of facts clear. The investigation, we don't even know if it's still ongoing. We haven't heard much about it lately. The lack of activity surrounding the investigations makes clear the, the, the majority here is not interested in pursuing this for any legitimate legislative purpose. This is about scoring political points. The chairman's public comments surrounding his need for the full report are almost exclusively focused on obstruction, but another important fact here, 99.9% .9 of the obstruction volume is available right now for the chairman to view. But he hasn't done that. 
Only six lines in over 182 pages is redacted in the obstruction volume. This is not about seeking the truth, as we've heard this morning. It's about raw partisan politics. Our Democrat colleagues have weaponized our critical oversight responsibilities. And moving today to hold the AG in contempt is not only premature, unprecedented, and unwarranted. Frankly, it is shameful. I think, we believe, the American people deserve better. I hope that they'll review the facts. I hope they'll look at all this correspondence. I hope they'll get beyond all this cloud of partisan politics and understand why we are taking the stand today that we are. I yield back. <laughs> Who seeks recognition? Gentlemen, for what purposes does a gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentlemen's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, last week we saw an attempt to change the rules of this committee that defied the historical precedent of, uh, uh, by applying only impeachment proceedings to Attorney General William Barr. And today we're zipping right along, and we know that uh, my colleagues on the other side have the votes. They're going to they're gonna try to hold this Attorney General in contempt. But I'm, I'm interested to see the look on the judge's face when my colleagues from the other side uh, present the, these, uh, these facts. The court's going to say, what would you do? Were you, were you in negotiations? Well, we were, but we kind of we, we scuttled that. Because we refused to hear from the Attorney General because we changed the rules, you know, Mr. Mr. Uh, Judge. We changed the rules so the Attorney General didn't come in. Uh, he offered to let us view the less redacted report, but I, I didn't do that. I didn't, I didn't even bother to go down there and look at that report. He offered to have staff members view the less redacted report with me. I, no, I said, no, we're not going to do that either. He permitted us to take notes on the less redacted report, and we rejected that as well. Um, he asked us to continue to negotiate, uh, see if we could work out our differences, but I rejected that as well. We attempted to compel him to respond in spite of federal law on Rule 6E, the grand jury material we've heard so much about today. We knew that there were some other witnesses that were important that might have shed light on this as well, but we didn't hold a hearing with uh, DAG Rosenstein. We didn't hold a hearing on Mueller before we issued our contempt citation. We didn't seek closed door, confidential, classified hearings with any of these individuals. In fact, Judge, you know what we did? We undercut our whole argument by making the argument to uh, uh, Mr. Barr, saying, hey, look, you know, Mr. Barr, why don't you just join us? Why don't you just join us in asking the court to authorize release of 6E material? What does that do? It says, quite frankly, that the folks that will be sitting there before a court propounding um, execution of a contempt citation, they're going to have the great privilege of saying, yeah, we put a sword of Damocles over William Barr. We created a Hobson choice. We said, guess what, Mr. Barr? You either get held in contempt or you violate federal law. Because that's just the way we do things in Judiciary Committee these days. That's just the way it is. That is unprecedented and it will hold this committee up to derision. And as my colleague, Mr. Johnson from Louisiana said, there was a case that just came out last month, which said, and this, this gets to my colleague from Georgia who said, you can't be misled, there are exceptions. That's right, and the, and the court said, you must fit within one of those exceptions before you can release Rule 6E material. But don't be misled because nothing we're doing here today fits in to the Rule 6E exceptions. There's not an authorization under the 6E uh, uh, provisions right now. 
So there's going to be a problem, and I can't wait to see the judge, to look on the judge's face when these guys try to explain, well, we were trying to pigeonhole into something that's 6E. And then I'll just close in this area. When I hear that the wrecking ball is being taken to the Constitution, that it's being trampled upon, um, that we're a continued breakdown of constitutional order, these kind of arguments made over and over again, I, I can't help but say, if you think this administration, this president is so dangerous, where's, why aren't you acting on the many resolutions for impeachment you've already introduced? I mean, Mr. Johnson was pretty clear, this whole thing is about impeachment. Well, take it to the American people, take it, file your resolution. You've already filed them, act on them. With that, I, my time is up. Thank you. What purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, this subpoena puts the Attorney General in legal catch-22. To comply with the subpoena, he must break the law. If he obeys the law, he must disobey the <coughs> subpoena. Now, every person on this committee knows that the law forbids release of grand jury testimony. Congress is the law-making branch of government. If this committee feels it's so important to see the grand jury testimony, it can change the law. But it cannot order the highest-ranking law enforcement official in our country to break that law. You know, the American people can plainly see what's going on here. For two and a half years, they have been force-fed a brazen and monstrous lie that the President of the United States is a traitor who's loyal to a foreign and hostile power. Robert Mueller was given extraordinary powers to investigate this. He appointed one of the most partisan and biased teams of investigators that has ever been appointed to substantiate these charges. They spent 22 months and $25 million in direct and component costs doing so. They employed some of the most abusive tactics, among them perjury traps and threatening family members, in order to turn up some shred of evidence to confirm this narrative. The Trump administration gave them every document they requested and even waived attorney-client privilege to make the president's personal attorney available for 30 hours of testimony. Though the president had the clear constitutional authority to terminate or interfere with the investigation, he did not. Well, after all that, they were forced to admit that there's not a shred of evidence to support this lie. We're now learning it was predicated on a fake dossier fabricated by the Clinton campaign and was used by the highest ranking officials of the Department of Justice, the FBI, our intelligence agencies, and perhaps even the White House. First, to try to influence the outcome of our election and after failing that, to undermine the duly elected President of the United States and tear this country apart. Now that lies laid bare for all to see. The left's had now to think up a new lie and think it up quick. Thus, in a heartbeat, the lie changed from collusion to obstruction. That even though the administration did nothing to interfere or impede the investigation, the President is guilty of obstruction just because he complained about the injustice of it all behind closed doors in words that amounted to no action whatsoever. They know this lie won't hold up under scrutiny either. So what to do? Well, well, the answer to that question is before us right now. Even though there was no legal requirement for the Mueller report to be released publicly, the Attorney General has released it with the sole exception of material he is legally forbidden to release amounting to 92 percent of the document. He's offered the chairman and the ranking member of this committee the opportunity to review the additional redactions uh, that can be reviewed in a classified setting, uh, leaving uh, only um, about six lines out of 182 pages. But instead of reviewing that information or changing the law to allow for its public release, uh, they order the Attorney General to do what he legally cannot do and then charge there's a cover-up. They imply the smoking gun is now in that six lines and over 182 pages that cannot be legally shared, safe in the knowledge they'll never be called out on it. And they hope that there will be enough of a smokescreen to cover 
the perversion of our justice and intelligence agencies for political purposes under the Obama administration. One other point. Last week, the Democrats voted to change the rules of the committee to allow members to hide behind committee counsel to challenge the Attorney General. Mr. Chairman, we don't hire people to speak for us on the House floor, and we shouldn't hire people to speak for us in committee. Only members of the House should speak in House proceedings, and there's a reason for that. We're responsible and accountable for what we say in public forums, in this public forum. Hired help is not. The only rightful exception is when we sit as a tribunal, an impeachment, because then we're sitting as a jury to hear evidence. Any exceptions from this makes a mockery of representative democracy based on the direct accountability that representatives of the people must have to those who elected them. I yield back. What purpose does the gentlelady from Arizona seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, um, members and audience. You know, I ran for Congress to make a difference and get things done. We have a lot of big issues that are problems that are going on in our nation. Uh, we have a border crisis. I'm from Arizona. Uh, we have lots of uh, humanitarian and border crisis going on. Uh, we need to work to improve the education system in our country. We need to work to improve our health care uh, system. It's, uh, it, it's too expensive. And, um, you know, when I served nine years in the Arizona State uh, House and Senate, we actually got big things done. I worked with my Democrat colleagues and my Republican colleagues. And we got issues done, and that's what the American people want us to do. They want us to work together to get things done. And this hearing today does nothing, nothing at all, to further that cause. In fact, you know, I, I think that the, my Democrat colleagues are, are still in denial that the president was actually elected. Um, I saw it on election night. I stayed up late in Arizona and uh, saw the meltdown of some of the, um, you know, my Democrat colleagues and the media. Um, and then for two years, even before the election of President Trump, for two years now, there's been this nonstop uh, saying by my Democrat colleagues and others that, you know, somehow the Trump campaign was colluding with Russia. And they, they even said they had evidence of it. You know, they said it on TV over and over and over again. Well, it turned out to not be true. So two years later, you have the Mueller report. It says no collusion, no collusion. So instead of talking about that, which they've done for the last two years, now they're, they're changing their tune. And so now it's all about obstruction of justice. Well, let's review, and some of my colleagues have already gone through this, but, you know, Attorney General Barr released the Mueller report. He didn't have to do that. It wasn't the law to do it, but he did it because he did it for the public interest to release the Mueller report. Again, no collusion. Then the Department of Justice offered for Chairman Nadler to review a less redacted version of the Mueller report. Chairman Nadler refused. He has not gone. And in fact, I think in the volume two, which is the obstruction of justice part, only 0.1%, 0.1% of the report is actually redacted. Then Attorney General Barr agreed to testify right here in Judiciary Committee on May 2nd. And what happened? Instead of us being able to hear from him and ask him questions, Chairman Nadler insisted that the staff, the staff, should question the Attorney General Barr, which is unprecedented in this committee. You know, I believe, I, I don't know, I can't read his heart, but I believe this was done for headlines. I mean, here we had, right there, a blank chair, an open chair with a, with a name tag of, of uh, the Attorney General Barr, and then we had a member from this committee eat chicken and pose with a ceramic chicken? I mean, this is all political theater and political show that makes for, you know, good TV. But are we getting things done? No, we are not getting things done. And now, 
The Democrats and Chairman Nadler in this committee are asking the Attorney General to break the law, break the law, by releasing grand jury information to Congress. So now we're here today, and there's been a movement, a motion to, to hold Attorney General Barr in contempt of Congress at an incredibly fast pace. From the subpoena to the contempt, 19 days. Let's compare that to Eric Holder. It was 255 days. And we still don't have all the documents from Fast and Furious where a Border Patrol agent was killed. So all I can say is let's work together and get things done. Let's stop this political theater. Week after week after week, we're just having this theater. The American people want us to work together to work on the big issues. Let's secure the border. Let's improve education. Let's improve health care. Let's stop this political theater. I yield back. Lady. The gentleman yields back who seeks recognition. The gentleman, gentleman Chairman, for what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To say that I'm disappointed in the direction of this committee, I'd say would be an understatement. I'm echoing what my colleague, Ms. Lesko, said. You know, I was sent here to get things done, and I feel like my colleagues across the aisle have been just chasing a ghost for the last two years. Uh, during that time, we've suffered from a, an opioid pandemic. I say pandemic because it's everywhere in the United States. It's killing um, thousands of individuals. We have real problems to address immigration. We could be moving to a merit-based system that brings us in step with the West, rest of the industrial, industrialized world. And I have two bills with Democrat co-prime sponsors that could really make a difference, but instead we're here engaging in political theater, bringing in props, and again, just chasing this ghost for the last two years. You know, I have a bill called the Stoic Act with my colleague, Ms. Dean. And this would increase grants to local law enforcement for suicide prevention, for PTSD treatment. Law enforcement and first responders need this, and we could actually get this done. This is something that would be productive if we weren't wasting our time. I have another bill with uh, my colleague across the aisle, Ms. Blunt Rochester, it's called Clean Slate. It would seal the records of anybody convicted of a nonviolent criminal offense, give these individuals a chance to have a fresh start, be productive members in society, and move on once they paid their debt to society. Uh, this is something that thousands of people need across the United States. It's something that would help the workforce development in the United States. But again, instead, we're here for two years chasing ghosts, um, so again, to say that I'm disappointed in the direction of this committee is an understatement, especially when we have real work that we could be uh, focused on. With that, I would yield the balance of my time to Ranking Member Doug Collins. Thank you, and I appreciate the gentleman yielding. I think as we're coming, you know, in a lot of discussion this morning, a lot of things have been pointed out. I, I want to just sort of sum up, and it's very interesting to me, and I'll just sort of be funny here. We, in this country, we talk a lot about manufacturing and manufacturing jobs and the need for our economy. Well, we now have our committee pitching in because we're manufacturing a crisis. We're manufacturing something that doesn't need to exist and doesn't need to happen. In fact, the reason I know it's a manufactured crisis, I go back to the very words of, of, of many on the other side a few years ago, and even my chairman, when they joined a walk off of the House floor chamber to protest, the, in his words, the shameful and politically motivated GOP vote holding Eric Holder, Attorney General, in contempt. Walked off, upset, tore up, because they were holding Eric Holder in contempt after almost a year, over a year, 400 plus days in which accommodations back and forth were made, discussions were made back and forth. So really, we're just manufacturing a crisis because, number one, we didn't get what we want. Number two, we don't uh, like what we got. And there's nothing being hidden here. And yes, the Attorney General is following the regulation. Don't be deceived. He is. It's interesting that we go along, and also that some of the interesting things that's been talked about there, we talk about Nixon impeachment in Article 3, and this has been thrown out by my colleagues. All of the subpoenas issued to President Nixon, and again, a whole different inquiry, which was an impeachment inquiry, were issued after the impeachment inquiry was already started. These were not before the impeachment inquiry, they were after, and that's what we found that. In fact, the impeachment inquiry was opened on October 30th, 1973. All the subpoenas were from April to June of 74. So let's at, let's at least get our, our facts right. We've had issues you know, all day today that we've had to sort of correct. Number one being that uh, 
the uh, chairman now of the Oversight Committee was not sued in his personal capacity. Mr. Flynn is not in jail. He's pled guilty. He is still in that process, but he is not in jail, as was stated earlier. And also, though, I think we've finally come to the conclusion that I think we've all been waiting for, and it was really something interesting to come. And that was that my friend from Georgia actually gave us. And it was really sort of summed up this entire thing. It's what I talked about last week. It's what I talk about now. And my friend from Georgia said, and he brought down the curtain on this entire thing when he said, no documents, how do we impeach? If we don't have the documents, how do we impeach? Because right now, let's be honest, by that very statement, he's making the claim that they don't have enough to impeach because Mueller didn't give them impeachment. The report did not show collusion and did not charge obstruction. There's nothing to impeach. So now we've got to dig deeper. And my question is this. An investigation of a very, and I'll agree with my friends across the aisle, from a top-notch investigator, from top-notch attorneys who had unlimited access to a grand jury, unlimited access to subpoenas, unlimited access to uh, investigators, and over $30 million at least in budget, which is larger than any House committee. And we think we're going to find out something more than he found out? Come on, we're manufacturing a crisis, and that's why we're here. And I yield back. Gentlemen, you for what purpose is the gentleman from North Dakota seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I think we have some signals crossed. Um, I, until about 30 seconds ago, or t five minutes ago, or 10 minutes ago, this subpoena was for a full, unredacted version of the Mueller report. Um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have given speeches, have cited cases. Now, I don't think they're entirely relevant about releasing 6E material. We just had a witness, or just had a speech saying we get the entire report. Now we're hearing conversations about 6E isn't necessarily in it, but it's in the subpoena. It's a, the subpoena is simple. It is fully to have the unredacted Mueller report. And just in the way that words matter, the, the letter didn't say a proactive assertion of privilege, it said a protective assertion of privilege. And I think we can reasonably argue that one of the reasons they're doing a protective assertion of privilege is in order to comply with the subpoena, they would have to violate the law. Now we talk about compelling, or we talk about asking the attorney general to go to court to release rules or um, grand, jury, grand jury evidence. We talk about how that has happened in the past. First of all, in the case that had happened in, in the past, it was actually the Halderman case, and the reason the court ruled in favor of releasing the information is because they heard it was a comp because they ruled that it was a legal proceeding because it was an impeachment proceeding. Secondly, the Attorney General has no obligation to go to court, and by issuing a subpoena, this committee cannot compel him to go to court. This committee can go to court on its own to try and release that information, but by, by the way, and I'll be offering an amendment later, there's no guarantee that is going to happen either. So when we're having this conversation, when we're giving speeches, when we're going on CNN, when we're going on MSNBC, let's at least talk about what this is about. The subpoena was to release the full unredacted report. And regardless of the colloquy we we're having today, regardless of the debate we're having on, on, this, on this dais about that very information, that's what the subpoena says. So when you issue a protective, a protective assertion of privilege, you have the right to do that, particularly, I think, if you're the Attorney General and you think you'll have to violate the law in order to comply with the, comply with the subpoena. Secondly, and I think it, it becomes um, interesting and more important when we discuss how, how, this, how this has moved forward and where we're at. And by that, I mean, we're, we're citing the SB case, we're saying that we have all of these different issues, but nothing that has been redacted has been shared. It's only been shared from executive to executive. None of the underlying information has been shared. To say that there isn't a valid claim of assertion of executive privilege on that information, I think is, I agree with the ranking member, is a jump ball at best. So Would the gentleman yield? With that, yeah, I yield. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, with great respect, I guess the question may be to ranking member Collins. You said that executive privilege uh, has not been waived with respect to the redacted portions of the report. Not, I'm not talking about the grand jury piece. I'm talking about the other pieces. My understanding is that the ranking member has seen that unredacted material. Am I, am I mistaken? I haven't seen it, so. I know you haven't seen it, Mr. Armstrong, which is why we're here, right? I mean, fundamentally, it's so that the members of this committee, as well as the members, I would say, of the Intelligence Committee, I might add, can have access to those unredacted 
portions of the report so that we can ultimately do our jobs. And so that, that's, I just want to clarify that piece. And, well, and the answer, I think, becomes when you go into a contempt proceeding as you're working through this, and we're, I mean, I'm confused now as to whether 60 material is part of the subpoena. Um, actually, I'm not. I know it is part of the subpoena, but it's part of the conversation that has gone on. So asserting protective assertion of privilege, I mean, they, they're, they have the right to do that. What the ranking member has seen and hasn't seen under those settings, I, I think, is a completely different conversation. I yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. I yield my, uh, uh, as such time as the gentleman from Georgia uh, desires. Thank you, and I appreciate the gentleman yielding. And I agree, and, and this is one of the things that I've thought about a while, and as I men mentioned, it was a very true, sincere. I think we have a lot of good attorneys on this committee. That's why we were, you know, objecting not to have questions. And I would, if, if my friend from Texas and I were in a courtroom together, my immediate thought is, you know, trial lawyer would be objection calls for speculation. You're asking what speculation would be on what we would have said. But I don't have to have speculation on this. I have facts. What, what did happen during the previous administration when a contempt proceeding was going on? They actually did, the DAG actually made the preemptive assertion, uh, Jim Cole actually made the preemptive assertion for uh, the privilege. My friends across the aisle actually disagreed with this, didn't want it to happen, in fact walked out, made a big production saying it was all political and they should have never held Eric Holder in contempt. The interesting part is, and I go back to this that will actually be repeated and repeated and repeated, is that was over 400 days. We're still under, even at the generous two months level here. And I think it's really interesting having, because I want to go back to the, uh, really the interesting issue that Mr. Nagoose brought up, which is a, was a valid point, it's something to bring up, but it also strengthened my argument that we're going too quickly, that there were accommodations made. The Department of Justice were in the process of making accommodations, and they made that from the original intent of letting members go. That was never, I have never saw a definitive statement that said that's all we'll ever do. Okay, and I did go see it. I, that, was, that was public record. I did go see it. The chairman has not gone and seen it. Would the gentleman yield? I will. Uh, uh, ranking member, with, with, with all the respect in the world, uh, while I appreciate that, it seems to me that it's been pretty clear from the Department of Justice that they will only allow you and the chairman of this committee, as well as a few other members of this Congress, of this House, to see the materials you have. Our point is that the Republican members of the Judiciary Committee, as well as the Democratic members of this committee, as well as the Republican and Democratic members of the Intelligence Committee, ought to be able to review these materials to perform their critical constitutional duties. And that's why the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunez, joined with the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, in making the same request that this committee has made. Yeah, reclaiming my time, and I appreciate the, you know, the gentleman there, and I think, but I think this is the exact thing. That was the request actually was made yesterday, is we'll have this request. There's never been a definitive, we'll never do, because we've actually seen a request, or a, an offer made yesterday that was rejected, and that's why we're here today. That's part of negotiations. As anyone who's went through a negotiation process, that's part of the negotiation. You may not like the timing, you may not like it, but again, in less than 40 days, it's pretty interesting when we had 400 days and over, and over 300 days with Holder and then also with Myers and Bolton. It's, again, I think we're conflating the issues here, and it's really interesting. The 6E information, we don't need to gloss over that. If you're watching and you're, you're seeing this, don't gloss over the fact that, that we previously, in this committee, the majority rejected an amendment that said 6E information um, is not going to be a part of this because now we're looking at this, this information and, and it's been said several times what is the relevant and what are the speculation and where we go from. I go back to a statement that I made just the other day when the chairman and I were talking about another amendment and it goes back to this and this is just true. We vote on words on paper, not intent. We vote on words on paper and what words on paper say matter and intent is one that it may intend that we don't ask for this. We may intend that we don't want to do it, but that's not what we vote on in this the gentleman Congress. Yield, with the gentleman I, yield. I'm, I'll yield to the gentlelady. I, I thank the gentleman. We, we certainly could be in the courtroom. I just want to clarify that uh, Mr. Holder's activities were far more distinctive for the actual acts of the President of the United States. We are dealing with the actual acts of a President of the United States. And what I was saying, if that occurred, between 2012 and 2016, you would be, um, my good friends, 
rushing toward a particular procedure. Yeah, this has nothing, this has to do with actual acts of the presidency. I and, yield back to and you. And I reclaim my time, and, I, and is, that is exactly what my, you know, I believe my friends and as my uh, friends have said, are, you are rushing toward, but I also go back to this amendment to the gentlelady. This amendment is actually based on a case, and as I laid that out very clearly, this case is, is when you look at it even from the holder perspective, doesn't, wouldn't even apply there. This is actually the SB case we go for. Again, I think this all goes into the very assumption that this is why we need, uh, why this is rushed. That's why we've said this all along, and it just goes back to the court, because if, if taken to court, if, if my friends take this to contempt to court, if that's what they're intending to do, they're going to look at the record that was laid. And right now, that record and cupboard is bare. With that, I yield back to the gentleman from Colorado. And, and I Mr. Yield Chairman. Back. Today, we consider a report recommending that the House of Representatives hold Attorney General William Barr in contempt of Congress. I think it's disgraceful. Last week, when the Attorney General refused to show up for this committee's kangaroo court, the majority set up an empty chair, ate chicken, and pretty much made a mockery of this committee. It's worth noting that Attorney General did appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee the day before he was scheduled to come here, where the unreasonable demand that he be queried by staff attorneys was not made. Senators did the questioning themselves, as is normal, and the same should have been the case here instead of Chicken Gate. He had all of the elements to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they conspired together. There's a big difference between not having connections and having guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Then Mr. Trump gets on the telephone with Mr. Putin and has a 90-minute conversation or something like that where he can see on a phone call that he smiled at him. For what purpose is the gentleman from Ohio seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. What purpose is the gentlelady from Texas seek recognition? Strike the last word. Strike the last word. Strike the last word. Strike, move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman from uh, Florida. Uh, what purpose is the gentleman from Florida um, recognized? Uh, move to seek recognition. Move to strike the last word, Mr. Chairman. Strike the last word. Strike the last word. Strike the last word. Strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. I move to strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. Move the last word. Strike the last word. Move to strike the last word. Strike the last word. When I was courting my wife and trying to get her to agree to marry me, and I just wouldn't let her leave until she committed. And I just kept talking and talking and, and bringing up 6E and 6G and everything that I could. And so finally, 39 years ago, she agreed to marry me. So I won. Uh, but we can't let the Republicans win today trying to sweet talk us and trying to sweet talk the American people. The, the answer is very simple. We voted unanimously to release the report within the bounds of the law. That's what the Attorney General's doing, and that's what apparently you keep missing. I don't understand the, why that's so the difficult. Sweet talk, <laughs> the sweet talk is obscuring the real issue, and we need to stop the sweet talk. We have lawful responsibilities, constitutional responsibilities to, uh, to engage in, one of which is possibly impeachment. How can we impeach without getting the documents? Pretty question. How can we impeach? If we don't get the documents, how can we impeach if we don't get the documents? Ladies and gentlemen, this hearing is not about the Attorney General. It's not about the Mueller report, 92% of which everyone in America has had the opportunity to read. It's not about the fact that even the portions that the American people haven't been able to read, the Chairman's been able to go read had he chosen. This is all about impeaching the President. Some people know that you can't hold someone in contempt you can vote to do that but you can't be in contempt for failing to produce things that are illegal for you to produce nobody's asking the attorney general to disobey the law we're asking the attorney general to obey the law and produce the Mueller report and the supporting documentation um, the underlying evidence that we've been requesting for a couple months now. He offered to let the chairman and five other Democrat leaders review the less redacted report at, D at the D Department of Justice, including a 99.9 percent .9 unredacted volume on instruction. In an odd move for anyone demanding access to information, the chairman and the other elected Democrats given access have declined to view that report. The subpoena, as it stands today, 
requires the Attorney General to break the law to be fully compliant. If you look at it on its face, that's beyond dispute. I know that, and you know that, and, and yet you are nonetheless rushing to hold him in contempt. It's designed to be the foundation of a dialogue and is not designed to uh, force our hand in what we insist on in court. And Mr. Chairman, the beginning of a dialogue, let me yield to Mr. Buck, if I may. Mr. Chairman, um, I've never, I've issued many uh, subpoenas or requested the court to issue many subpoenas on behalf of prosecutor's offices that I've worked in. I've never considered it at the beginning of a dialogue. I've considered it a command by the court to produce documents. You've terminated our ongoing negotiations and abandoned the accommodation process. That's a dialogue. Why did you do this and why are we here if this is part of the dialogue? Um, we didn't terminate. They did by refusing to go make any offer in good faith. The gentlelady from Florida is recognized. I think it's all about trying to destroy Bill Barr because Democrats are nervous he's going to get to the bottom of everything. 2017, Senator Schumer on the Rachel Maddow show talking about then-President-elect Trump says this. If you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. Now, I don't know if the FBI went after President Trump in six ways, but I sure know they went after him in two ways. And the first one is the now famous dossier. On October 21st, 2016, the FBI used one party's opposition research document as the basis to go to a secret court to get a warrant to spy on the other party's campaign. That happened. Democrat National Committee, the Clinton campaign, paid Perkins Coie Law Firm, who hired Fusion GPS, who then hired a foreigner, Christopher Steele, who did what? Talked to Russians and put together this. In contempt for refusal to comply with a subpoena duly issued by the Committee on the Judiciary as amended favorably to the House. Those in favor respond by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. And the ayes have it. Roll call, Committee Mr. Report. Chairman. The roll call is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Ms. Jackson Lee? Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 ayes and 16 noes. The ayes have it, and the committee report as amended is ordered reported favorably to the House. 